session, we will address, we will address the topic, survival parent, tips for successfully homeschooling. And today we are joined by our very own Dr. Joan Bob Ward, campus dean at the Tobago campus. Dr. Bob Ward has been an educator for the past 44 years. She has served at all levels of the education system in Trinidad and Tobago and has been a special educator for the past 28 years. She holds a PhD in education, a Master of Education with Distinction in Youth Guidance, a Bachelor of Education with First Class Honours in Educational Administration, and a Certificate in Education, teaching for the hearing impaired from the University of the West Indies. She's also a research supervisor for postgraduate students and practicum supervisor for the Bachelor of Education, Education Administration, and the Bachelors of Early Education, Childhood Care and Education. The national in contributions include serving on the Cabinet Appointed Advisory Committee on Special Education at the Trinidad and Tobago Unified Teachers Association Special Edu Committee education committee and the cabinet appointed committee for standardizing of trinidad and tobago sign language dr bob ward is an avid researcher and has presented conference papers locally and internationally and as i indicated dr bob ward is here with us today so i'm going to hand you over to her and she's going to take us through the session that is so very important to us dr ward Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, and oh, I'm sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's so afternoon. good to be here and to discuss some tips for successful homeschooling with you. I trust that you are all well and that you're staying safe. And as you, as you were, yes, good, I'm hearing yes. As you were entering the room, we heard the mighty sparrow education and some of the younger ones might not might not know that calypso but for those who know it and for those who heard the lyrics what came to mind about education as you listen to the mighty sparrow talk to me what came to your mind anybody anyone he said, children go to school and learn well, but we're in a different scenario now. There's no going to school physically, per se. <laughs> yes, he was saying, go to school, get up and dress and take your bag and go to school, right? Walk or, or jump on the bus. Yes, thank you for that. Anybody else, what came to mind as you heard the lyrics from the Mighty Sparrow? And education will always guarantee us a better life. Education will always, always guarantee us a better life. Thank you so much. Will always guarantee us a better life. So he was saying to us that education is important. And if, and, and if, you know, he said, without it, we're better off dead. Without it, we're better off dead. Can I have a contribution from just one more person? What came to mind as you, as you listen to the mighty sparrow? Okay, I didn't quite get that uh, contribution. Did the parent interpret? <laughs> yes. He said, otherwise you're going to catch real hell. Otherwise you're gonna catch real hell. And what do we mean by real hell? What do we mean by that? Suffering. We will suffer. We will suffer. And, and I imagine as we shifted to homeschooling last year, some parents became very anxious. How did you feel, parents and grandparents, when we had our first case and the prime minister addressed the nation and he said, all learning institutions will be closed. How did you feel about your child's schooling at that time? Tell me, give me some one word feeling, some deep, honest feelings. Scared. I'm scared, sorry. indeed. Scared. Anything very, else? Very concerned. 
Yes, I was okay. very concerned. Yeah. Very concerned. Yes. I'm sorry, Judy, because um, my kids um, are special needs children, so it's a different type of learning for them. Yes, Alice. Yes, Alison, indeed. Is it yeah. Alison? Yes, yes, indeed. And yeah. um, and I attended a webinar recently where we were discussing the learning loss for persons with disabilities, children with disabilities. Yeah. And they generally experience learning loss during the vacation. Yes. And now because of the pandemic, it is even worse. Yes, yes. so I they, understand. They, they forget very quickly. It's like you have to start over every day from the yes. beginning. Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Any more please? Any Anybody else? What, just one more word. How did you feel? It was challenging. I felt very challenged about it because I was wondering how would I engage my grandson and be there with him for this new type of learning? How he yes. would cope with it? Yes, indeed, Intra. And I have a grandson at home as well, and he loves to go to school. Yes. So I was worried. Yes. I was worried about him. I was really worried about him. So today we are going to discuss this sudden change to homeschooling. We will discuss the demands of homeschooling and we are going to uh, examine some of the challenges that parents and children face. And we're going to talk about some strategies for managing this homeschooling of which you're learning and how you as parents cope with what is taking place. So we're going to talk about the pandemic uh, briefly we're going to look at the challenges. We're going to talk about how we create an atmosphere for learning, how we organize the environment, how we use your supports, and how you stay alive and sane during all of this. So how did we get here? How did we get here? Late uh, 2019, it was, we started hearing about the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus. And at that time, some persons referred to it uh, as a Chinese virus because it originated in China. At that time, it was very far away from us. But I am one of the, the parents <laughs> who uh, would think way down the road. And so I started talking to my staff at school. I said, listen, this thing is going to get here. It is going to come to Trinidad and Tobago. That was uh, at the end of January. I said, you all need to go to the supermarket now, you know, and start to purchase items. And they were looking at me as though something was wrong with me. But I actually went to the supermarket and got, got um, stuck. And then it started to get closer and closer. And I think it was on the 12th of March, we had our first case. And the prime minister decided that we had to close school. And the children were home for a while. Uh, the education was not immediately offered to them or continued. But after a while, we moved to remote learning or what some people to homeschooling. But I imagine just, uh, just as, as the picture we're looking at, it was an upside down challenging situation for all of us. And we heard some words a while ago, scared, concerned. It was a challenge for me. It was worrisome. It was worrisome. And here are some of the, the words that you yourself mentioned, anxious, concerned. It was overwhelming for some. And for all of us, even up to today, there is some measure of uncertainty. But I still wondered if my grandson was learning. I was worried. I thought that you know he was not managing until I saw his report. And I said, oh, so he was doing some work. He was doing some things. But the demands of homeschooling, I mean, there's, there's no word to describe it, I can imagine. Let us just take in this picture for a while and imagine that this was our home. Imagine that we had this many children, all, all participating in homeschooling. Could, could, you, could you tell me some words or even sentences to describe what you're seeing here? How does it appear to you? Chaotic. 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 
because everybody has something else to do. And it, for as a parent, how easy is it for you to manage this? Because you said chaotic, how easy is that? I can't begin to think how to manage this. I only have one child. This is confusing. <laughs> it is confusing. <laughs> it really is. You only have one child. And, and uh, we're not to uh, let the others think that having one child makes it easy. You know, it's not really easy because yeah. this is something new. And the whole world was thrust into this situation suddenly. Mm -hmm. So it is not easy. I, I remember meeting a parent in a webinar and that parent said she had two children with disabilities and that it was, it was a challenge. Yes, and somebody just said it's confusing. And when things are confusing, we just do not know where to turn. Do not know. So let me, hear, let me hear some more responses based on the picture we're looking at here. Confusing, chaotic. To me, the children themselves seem to be all over. It, they seem confused themselves. Yes, yes, and indeed they are. Indeed they are. As a matter of fact, um, very early in the lockdown, my grandson's sleeping pattern changed. Yeah. It, it moved from getting up at 6 or 5 a.m. and going to bed in the night to getting up at 5 p.m. I think it was because he was in the house so much and, and, and the routine had changed and his whole, his whole clock, his whole rhythm had changed. So he was confused, I was confused, I was worried. And of course the children are confused themselves. This is new for them. They are accustomed to getting up and getting ready and being taken to school and participating in a schedule. Yes. And this was so different. And because of, of, of some of the home circumstances, it would have been extremely chaotic it would have been very new and different and confusing for them as well. So let us talk now about some of the challenges that children face. For some of us, we were able to, to assist our children better than others, but some did face, some faced some challenges. Lack of access to technology. So there was digital, digital inequity because some persons, some parents were not able to provide the uh, devices for their children. And in, in the case, you know, in cases where there was one child in the home, yes, it might have been easy to provide a device. And before the government and pr the private sector began donating, some children had to share their parents' cell phones. Do you know of any such stories? Does anybody know of any, know of any such stories where children had to share, sometimes even a cell phone? Yes, um, there was a student in my son's class. He was unable to attend most of the classes because he had to wait until his mom returned from work in order for him to log on to class. And he usually he would miss a lot because they were preparing for SE at the time and the other children had to chip in and you know help him where he missed out yes yes that is a real situation but it didn't just they just didn't have the devices and i remember i went to have some pictures framed one day and a parent came in to have work printed uh she had the work on her cell phone and it was work for several children on a cell phone she came to have them printed and, and you know, my heart, my heart bled because I realized that it's not very easy for some persons. So there was digital inequity and then we had the connectivity issues. Some did not have access to um, the internet and so they were not able to access classes. So our children moved from having a bag with books and pencils and pens to having to manipulate laptops and tablets. And for some of them, uh, 
for some of the children, it would have been uh, difficult for them to learn, but more so for the parents who might not have been familiar with the te technology. In some instances, I know the children were actually teaching the parents how to use these devices. There was some level of difficulty. The children experienced difficulty concentrating. Remember, it was a new experience for them. And that caused me as a grandparent to be very anxious. I was really worried. I was confused. I didn't know what to do. I complained. I went into, you know, into his, his, his space often to check to see what he was doing because I realized he was not always on task. He was not managing the time. He, he attended a, a denominational school. And every morning they would have this assembly and worship. And sometimes I would have to go and remind him that it is time for worship. And, and, and I think one of the most challenging situations for them was the isolation. Why do you think so? Why do you think this would have posed a great challenge for these children? Because children are social creatures, um, by and large. Um, they, they, they like interacting with other children of their age. They like, I mean, that's, that's how they do a lot of their learning as well. So taking yes. that, that particular circumstance would be, would be a, you know, like pulling them from a, a certain level of an umbilical cord. So they, they, would, they would react differently, depending on the child. Of you know? course. Of course, of course. Yes, we are social beings. We are social beings. And children love to interact with their peers. And suddenly, they're sitting at home on a chair by a desk. And, and, and you know, they're seeing their, their, their peers' faces sometimes uh, on, 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 on the screen. And they're not able to interact in the way that they, they want to. And so they, they felt isolated felt isolated. So there they were at home, no friends to interact with, schools invaded their homes, uh, teachers were teaching them in their homes, and, and, and things really, really were different for them. So those were some of the challenges that they faced. For the parents, the challenges would have been in sourcing devices, understanding the children's work, and there's a T there, I don't know how it got there. Understanding the children's work, there's some parents who experience difficulty because of their circumstances in understanding the children's work. So some needed real help where that was concerned. And then we had to keep them focused. And I explained to you the challenges I faced with my grandson, keeping him focused. And, and he was so closed off that he hardly came out of the bedroom. The child's complexion changed because he didn't even, he didn't go outside for a long time. So we had to keep them focused. We had to try. We also had to balance teaching and household because we found ourselves because some of our teachers didn't quite understand how to, to manage this whole issue of online teaching much of the work fell on the parents. So parents were actually teaching their children at home and doing their housework. And that was challenging. I've spoken to parents who, who said, you know, it was so hard and they were so tired at the end of the day. And before they knew it, it was time to get up and start this whole routine on another day. Some had difficulty establishing a routine that worked for them and, and some worked some parents were actually going to work. So some children were unsupervised. Other parents were working from home and it was difficult to concentrate on your work as well as assist a child with this homeschooling. So, and we heard from one of our colleagues that she had to manage this type of learning for more than one child. So it was indeed a challenge and continues to be a challenge for parents and for children. And, and, and although this session focused on parents and survival tips, if our children are experiencing challenges, those challenges are ours. 
So I felt that it was necessary to highlight the challenges that children face as well. So here are some suggestions. Some of us might have gone past this already, but for some of us, it is still a challenge. We need to create the atmosphere for learning, create the atmosphere as much as we can, do as much as we can to do that. So we have to prepare the physical space. And we, have, we, we live in different, under different circumstances, under different conditions. And so whereas some homes might have a library or a library space or some free area, for some children, it was the bed. It is the bedroom. Wherever it is, whatever space is available, we can prepare that physical space and make it a space that is special for that child to be able to do his work. And I saw some instances where a parent said she used a biscuit tin and she, I, I don't know if the younger ones know what a biscuit tin is, but it was a large tin uh, in which we got our biscuits long ago. And she, she put, you know, something soft, like a cushion at the top of it. And she used uh, uh, the lower part of a dressing table, pulled out the drawer and, and placed something on top of that so that the child could sit in the bedroom and work because there was no other place for that child to be. Wherever it is, let that child recognize that this is my special place for learning. Let us try as far as possible to make it a quiet space for the child. So if we can avoid, you know, not having that child on the porch where all the traffic would be passing and then it's disturbed, then we should, we should do that. Find a quiet spot with lighting that is adequate. And, and of course, it's all based on your circumstances. Do the best that you can. So you walk around the home and you look to see what is the best spot? Where can I get, you know, lighting? And, and um, when I had to teach from home, I said, my husband, I said, go oh, and get me. I need a light. I just need a light so that I, I'll be able to work here. Because the, 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 the room was not well lit. It was a library, but not well lit. And so he went and he got a, a nice little fluorescent light. And I was able to use that. So I had enough light. And then we need to have cool air. As cool as possible. A quiet fan. If we, if we live in, in, you know, in a space where we can open the windows and we can have fresh air, that is so much better. If not, try to get a fan that is relatively quiet and place it in a position where it will not disturb the child or blow away the papers and things like that so that the child will be cool enough. Because if they're hot and sweet, they will not be able to function well. If they cannot see, if the place is noisy, they will not be able to function well. We should also make the seating as comfortable as possible. As comfortable as possible. And provide the tools that this child needs. So if you just take a look at the picture, we'll see the parents and the child, you know, they're there and they're working through. They've set up a nice little area where the child has all that she needs so that she can learn. We should try to do the best that we can and involve our child, our children, in, in developing and setting up that space. There is nothing better than, than knowing that you have a special space to do your duties. I say avoid the bed if possible, but if the child must be on the bed, the child should not be lying on the bed. Because when you lie down, that, that, is, that, that, that is about rest and sleep, relaxation. You want the child to be alert. So if, if there is no other space and this child must sit on the bed, then this child must use the bed, then ensure that the child sits on the bed. I said before, we should try not to use the porch or the kitchen or the television area. 
And there's sometimes, like I know of a parent who had to run a string across the room and put a sheet. And that's a long time thing that we knew in the country in Tobago, where you divided the living room and so with that would be called a blind. Sometimes you may even have to put up a blind because you may be living in, in you know, in, in, in a room or space that doesn't allow you to have the partition, but still make that space cozy and, 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 and let the child recognize it as their space, his space for learning or her space for learning. So once you have created the space for learning, then you work on the atmosphere. Yes, we have the space for learning, but we also have to work on that psychology that child's mind. And so we are anxious, yes. We are confused, yes. We are busy. And sometimes based on all of this and, 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 and based on what the child is experiencing, the child is stressed. So we should try to remove all the stressors, not pass on our stress to the children and assist them with focusing on what they need to do. So remove the stressors. Don't get too, don't get too anxious. So let them see your anxiety. And, and in the early I was extremely anxious. So I was, I was going into the room every minute just to check to ensure that he was on task and so on. But it was, it became easier when I explained to him the, the need to remain focused, the need to ensure that he completed his tasks. And it's important for you to know the tasks that the child is supposed to perform. In the case of, of his school, uh, every day his, his work was put in Google Classroom. So I was able to look at it, it was sent to me. So I was able to look at it to see what he needed to do. If that is not done with your child, it's important to have a conversation with your child as well, so that um, you understand what the child needs to do and that you assist the child with focusing and planning what they need to do. What we found as well was that um, children were on the screen for extended periods. So on the screen learning, uh, when they took a break for lunch, they were on the screen as well, having lunch and, and playing a game on the screen. When they, were, when they broke at the end of the day, they were on the screen as well, playing games. And then they were on the screen again, doing homework. So it was a whole day of screen time and then they lie in, in the night sometimes with their friends. To create this atmosphere for learning, we should create a schedule. We should create a ske schedule for them and help them to understand, or with them I should say, with them, and help them to understand, all right, you have to be online with your teacher between this time and this time, but you need a break from the screen time and try to fill it with some other rewarding experience. And one of, one of the ways, one of the ways to help here is to discuss it in a positive way with the child. And not to quarrel and say, well, it was on the screen and you're not playing any game now and whatever, because what we would be doing when we do that is, is setting up technology as a coveted item. Rather than doing that to them, we should help them to strut it and help them to recognize, okay, we should spend this time doing schoolwork. And then we could take a break from the screen because the screen will get us tired and, 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 and you know, our eyes will suffer, our brains will suffer. We will be stressed out and we will not be able to complete some of the other tasks that we need to do. So let's try to do this within this time on the screen. Yes, I know you will like to play some games. Let's see the best time of day to schedule the games. So we know we're not saying you're not playing any games, you know, because this is technology stairs. We know that. And we know that they will want to, they would want to play their games. So we have to be careful about how we deal with screen time with them. So we can create a schedule. And we separate the class time from the assignment time with a relaxing activity. And when we do all of this, we are really preparing for our own survival. Because whatever the children go through affects us. 
whatever we go through affects the children. Let's work together with them to ensure that we assist them in navigating all of the challenges. So we said that we must assign this space and, this, and, and we have to prepare this atmosphere. So we want to talk a little bit more about this space and how this space creates this atmosphere for learning. So once we've designated the area for learning, we have to, we have to ensure that it, there's some structure where this area is concerned. So it's important to keep this space neat. It shouldn't be all in a tumble because a, a tumble is a signal for chaos. We can use a tree, a box, a basket, or something that we have in the home as, as a receptacle, receptacle for the supplies. So you see that nice little tray set out there. I can see the ruler. I can see, you know, the little things in that tray. And then, you know, there is the device. And um, one, one, one researcher said, if you have several devices in the home, that you labor one school. So they know when they get onto that device, that is my school device. For some persons, it is not possible. And this is why I, I said before that we should schedule a time for school work, a time for playing your games, a time for interacting with your friends, schedule some time more for relaxing activities. So you're in, and, and of course, if there's a line across that TV, the TV has no place in this at all. It should not be there. So this space is set up, this atmosphere is set up for learning and for, for helping the child. So we're organizing the child for learning by letting them get up, and get dressed for school. I'm not saying they should put on the school uniform. Some schools were asking for uniforms and some were not. But we do not want children attending classes in their pajamas. Tell me why. Tell me why. Because they wouldn't have that school atmosphere at all. They would think that they are home. They will think that they're home, they think it's sleep time, bedtime. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. when you put on when you put on your, your, your sleeping clothes, your pajamas or what, whatever else, you know, it, 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 it's because you're ready to just forget everything and relax. And so if we don't get them out of bed and get them dressed for school, they are going to be in that sleeping, resting, relaxing mode. And that does not work well for their learning. So get them up and get them dressed. And then because we were at home, we started to have our meals at any time of day. But, but when the children began their homeschooling, they had a timetable. And so for us parents, we need to organize meal times around the school's timetable. When they went to school, got up, dressed them, went to school, they had breakfast, and then they had a break time, and then they had a lunch time and an afternoon break, and then they came home, and you know, and, and in the evening they had a dinner and so on. This, we should stick to this, you know. We should organize the meal times. We have the breakfast, let them have their breakfast before school. When they have their break, let them have their snack and so on. So there is some structure. There is some structure. We don't want them going to class hungry on mornings because we didn't get up in time or they didn't get up in, in time to prepare their breakfast. Provide a structure, organizing for learning, right? Organizing the meal times around the school's table. And then they have, you see, just as they packed the books in the night for school next day, have them do the same thing. Prepare the material for the next day and have them ready, have all the resources ready. And parents, uh, what I, I did this, when the school sent the timetable, I made a copy which I kept, and my grandson had a copy. So I knew at any time of day what he was supposed to be doing. You should keep a copy of that timetable. And it is good when you, you can sit with them and say, well, okay, I know you have science at nine o'clock this morning. You know, what do you have to um, prepare for your science class? When you engage in that deep kind of 
conversation and say, instead of saying, get ready for school, get your things ready. When you get down into it and you say, right, I know you have math and then you have biology at, you know, in the afternoon, they know that you are into what they have to do and you are going to get better results because they know that you're on, you're on the ball, you're on the case, you know what's happening. So talk to them about the schedule and communicate with the teachers communicate with the teachers and as you organize for learning, it is important for you to schedule some physical activity with them because they could be working all day and then just go and lie down again and they're not being active. And if they were at school, they would have been walking around the compound, they might have been running around the compound and so on. If, if you can't go outside into the yard, you could organize some nice little dance competition in the house with them, something to keep them going and do it with them so that they, they enjoy it and, and you enjoy it as well because they have to survive and you have to survive. So we spoke about creating the environment and we spoke about creating the atmosphere. But we need help as parents and grandparents. We need help. We need to recognize that we cannot do it all by ourselves. We have support systems that we can utilize to assist us in navigating this and in surviving this. Survival is important. So you can have siblings assist with projects. You can have your spouse or relatives assist with what the children need to do. And I mentioned earlier, that some parents were experiencing some levels of difficulty in understanding the children's work. But there are persons we can reach out to to help us. We're not to be ashamed, you know, of anything because nobody knows everything. There are things that we do not know. So we should seek the help wherever the help is available. Some of us also needed help with supervision. And so grandparents and our family networks can help us and help us to supervise. For those who have several children or some who still need to go to work, or even if you're working from home, there's some level of supervision that your children need. You cannot leave them all up to themselves. So we need to ask for help from our support systems. We need to communicate with teachers so that we understand what the teachers are doing what the teachers need, what our children need, so that suddenly so we'll be all on one page and that we understand what is taking place. I had some students in my classes that I teach at Custard who were working. So they were attending my classes. They were teaching during the daytime. They were teaching from home. And they had children to support. Children who would be homeschooled, they had those children to support. So that is a very complex situation as well. And that is a situation in which we need to reach out and get all the help that we can. At the same time, exercising patience because anxiety could get the better of us and we could, we could really break down mentally. And we could begin to snap at the children. We could begin to just give up, drop everything and do nothing. So we have to really think through our situation. Each person should think through their situation and maybe make some jot-ins. Yes, I have this to do, why to do, this child needs to do X, Y, Z. How am I, how I, how am I going to navigate all of this? And that uh, documenting, logging things can help us to plan, to schedule and to deal with things better. So let's temper our anxieties, understanding, understanding, because I know one of the, one of the fears eh, is that we think that our children are going to lose out. Oh, our children are going to miss. But remember, the whole world is in it with us and that it is the first time for us but it's the first time for the whole world. So everyone is in it with us. We are not alone. And I want you to console yourself and, 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 and so on with this. I also wish that you would take, I'm asking you to take some mental health breaks. 
take a break from everything. It's a lot. You know, we, we don't want to contract the COVID-19 virus and that is enough stress on its own. We want our children to succeed. That is, that is stressful. We have to work from home. The devices are breaking down. The internet is not, you know, and there's so much that we have to do. Yet we have to get the meals ready. We have to get the clothes ready. We have to do other things. Stop sometimes. Take a break. Do something for you. Something that you will enjoy. Something that will take your mind off of all that you have to do. If your children, you realize that they're slipping away, they're not motivated anymore, sit with them and discuss the positives. What went well for you today? Start with the positives. How was your day? Tell me what went well for you. And when you start with the positives, it, it gives the child a, a positive feeling. And then you deal with the negatives. Okay, what didn't go so well for you? And there is this sandwich method that I want to introduce you to. In a sandwich, you have you usually have the bread on the top, bread at the bottom, and you have the meat or whatever in the middle. The sandwich method is a way of dealing with serious issues. And when you have to discuss uh, serious issues with your child, start with the positive. So the first bread on top, that's a positive. The bread at the bottom is also a positive and deal with the negative issues in the middle, but do not let the child go away with the negative. End the conversation with something positive and you will have a child who feels good about you know, himself, good about herself, wanting to come back to discuss issues with you because you're not leaving them bruised at the end of it. If they didn't do a course well or the teacher complained about something or whatever, you know, praise them for, for being early for class in the first place. Talk to them about the negatives and then talk again about how well they managed some other subject during the day. It, it helps them too when you, when you get down into the work and you display it and you talk about it and, and so on. They love that, especially the younger children. We should also give them detailed praise, identified what went well and help them with what didn't go so well. Schedule some rest time and the rest time would be for the child, would be for you and all of that. And this last one here I want to tell you about some of us thought we were the teachers. We are not the teachers. We are coaches sitting beside our children and encouraging them. We are not the secondary teacher or the next teacher. And in some instances, I know we were forced into the role of teaching, but even if we have to help our children by explaining things to them, we must do it as though we are a coach. They have one teacher, yeah, in, in the case of the primary school children or, or several teachers in the case of the secondary schools, but we are the parents and we should act as coaches to encourage our children to succeed, to do well, to excel, to do the best that we can. For you, make room for your well being. Be a good friend to yourself. So if, some, if you didn't do something very well, with respect to the homeschooling, uh, imagine that you are your friend and that you're talking to you about the thing that you didn't do so well. And a real good friend is not gonna make you feel bad. So when you have to talk to yourself about something that you didn't do very well with respect to homeschooling, do it in a positive manner and reach out and get the help that you need. And again, I'm saying exercise patience, take mental health breaks. So you movement is, is what they should say. Do some movement in the home. Yeah, tell jokes, get the family together, play some games. Decide we're gonna have a treat night. Let's make pizza tonight or let's make some current roll or something. You know, let's make pizza of a different shape or something. But get them into doing these kinds of activities that will give them a break. And I say again, remember, we are all in this for the very first time. And I know I said quite a lot and you might have some questions for me. So ask me what you wish at this time.
Dr. Bob Ward as we, well, we know it's still uncertain times, but the intention of course is for us to be back out there and the children to be back out there in September. But we may have to juggle both, you never know. What tips can you give us as we, some children are on vacation, yes, but they're still doing work, they're still in school, you still have your lessons and everything, but how can we actually bring them to a point that if they have to go back out to school, how they manage that and the little anxieties and stuff. Okay, I love this question. Uh, school is closed. And when school is closed, our children usually experience learning loss, generally experience learning loss. And for the parents with, with, with uh, children with disabilities, we know, we said earlier that they experience more loss. At this time, we do not want our children to, uh, to be overwhelmed, but it is important for us to still have them engage in some pleasant learning activities that do not quite resemble what transpired during the school term. So we have to find some creative learning activities. At the same time, we have to begin to talk to them about returning to the classroom. So they need to know that at some point you were at home for a year and, and six months maybe, but if things change in the country, you might return to school in September. And uh, things will not be as they were when you were learning from home on your, on your uh, devices and so on. So we have to sort of ease them into, into understanding that it will return to perhaps almost what it was before. All right, so, so that preparation should begin even now so that they, they begin to set their minds to, to the fact that, right, I, I used to get up and have my shower and my breakfast and sit at my desk, but, but I might have to begin again to get up earlier because I'm at to travel or I have to go to my parents or whatever into a classroom. And the schedule is going to be different. I may no longer be manipulating my devices as much as I did. I may have to return to the books. And, and so we, we have the conversation with them and, and get from them how they feel about it as well and what their fears are. And, and, and when they begin to discuss their fears, then we have to address those fears. And one of the fears might be contracting the COVID-19 virus, knowing that it is uh, going to be with us for some time. And in some instances, we may have to get literature for them or get help for them, you know, so that they, they, they understand uh, what's, you know, what's required of them when they get back to the classroom. For some, I, I imagine that it might be staggered. So some days they may be attending school, some days so. So you can discuss all the, the possible options with them, get their feelings on it and address uh, address some of those. And someone is asking, what are some suggestions for activities that we can have with our children at this time? All right, so as I said, it's not regular school. And there are many online resources with games, learning games that, that that's, you know, they can engage in. You can have them have set up, if you have more than one child in the home, perhaps you can set up some you say, well, this week, what, what is the family going to be doing this week? What is going to be the new learning for this family this week? All right. So this week, we're going to be learning about dinosaurs. Right. Okay. And have them go on and, go on and find out things and not go make it like school, you know, make it like a nice little family activity where each person is going to come and they're going to present their thing and their findings and, you know, and things like that. And you could even make it like a social event where they, they pretend that they, they're holding a webinar on this and you so so we can make it nice and, and interactive and so on. Play games, have have um, of course, have the little research activities that do not look like school work and so on. Yeah. Doctor. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes Miss Duncan. Yeah, I have a question. No. Sure. Um, about five, six to five, five to six months prior to the lockdown last year, my second grandson said to us, I would like to be homeschooled. Oh. So then the lockdown came and he was very happy. Now to go back out to school, he already started protesting. Oh. What suggestions do you have? 
to kind of lure him into accepting that this is this has to happen. He has to go back out because he definitely okay. doesn't. Want to. So, so, um, Ms. Delta, he was he was looking at homeschooling in the traditional sense of homeschooling, where he didn't want to attend school at all, but he wanted yes. to be taught at home by a private teacher, perhaps. Mm, exactly. Uh, yes. But um, the pandemic forced them into, into the home, pushed the schools into the home. And so it was something like what he would have preferred to do. That's right. He understands now that he has yeah. to go back to um, what, what they call in-person learning. And he doesn't want to do it. That's right. So that's a hard one. <laughs> I, must, I must admit that it is a difficult, it will be traumatic for him mm -hmm. because... He felt as though he was on his way to what he wanted. Uh, if you can have him homeschool, that would be the ideal. If, if not, uh, you have to have some conversations with him and help him to understand. Well, discuss the, 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 the why, why homeschooling at this time is not possible for mm. him. And um, have him, he seems to be very sharp. So have him look at the two options, uh, going to school, what are the challenges that I think I would face if I had to go to school, uh, what are the benefits, and he will be able to manage that. Eh? Um, what will I benefit if I go to school and I learn from school? What will I not like about it? Uh, what are the challenges now? What is preventing us from being able to provide you with this at the moment? And have talk with him in his, you know, in a way he could understand and have him wait too and um, select the best scenario at this time, at this point in time. Oh, okay, all right, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Now, if, are there any other questions? Chanel? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, Chanel. Okay, so for, as we did mentioned earlier about children being social features, well, we being social features, but for smaller children who, like in my case, my son was taken out from preschool. So he started primary school not having any real friends. And this is a concern for me in terms of um, how to probably caution him in terms of interacting and making new friends if and when school does reopen in the physical sense. Um, because small children like that, they like to hug, they like to touch, they like to play. And that that is one of the things that is a true concern to me, not just the interaction, but just being able to form the relationship because even being in online school for a year, no real friendships yes. and relationships were formed in that year. And that is something that I am concerned about. So if you have any tips or advice or anything regarding that. For, um, for these younger children, social stories help where we, we uh, perhaps think of some situations and com compose some stories about children making friends and so on. Um, on the internet too, we may find some social stories that can help about children going to school on the first day and making friends and so on. But I want to tell you something, with all that you will, can do at home in terms of talking to the child and helping the child to, to understand that you're going out there and you're going to meet new people and, 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 and so on and and, and, and talking about the need for, for making friends and showing them all the videos about forming friendships and sharing and caring and so on. Much of it lies on the teachers when they go out and what the teachers do to ensure that these children are comfortable in the environment, to ensure that they make friends and, and, and that they're comfortable throughout the day. So you can, you can start to talk about it, talking about it with the children. And then, not any lecture, no, you know, discussions, 
from um, talking about school, showing them pictures, drawing their things for them. And as I said, the internet, you can just type in almost anything and find a video on the internet that can help, can help. Love friendship and sharing and caring uh, um, for each other, play, how to play and so on. But I heard in the middle of it, I heard of the fear of hugging and so on. And this is something we have to continue to teach them that they cannot hug, they cannot share snacks, you know, they can't interact in certain ways. But the teacher has to help you with that. And it's important for you to share the concern with the teachers, share the concerns that you have with the teachers. And there are protocols that I know the schools already have. For example, there are children out in schools now doing um, CSEC. And there were protocols that were approved by the Ministry of Education. Um, so they go out, they cannot get to school before a certain time. Who knows, that might be our case. When they get to school, they cannot interact with, 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 with um, their friends in the way that they did. Uh, they have the physical distance in the classrooms. They have to be picked up at a certain time and so on. So there are set protocols, but you also have to um, begin to talk with each other about it as well. And, and it's a young child, so we just have to keep doing it over and over and over again, using all whatever resources we can find. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great. So that brings us to about an hour in our session, which is so, it passed so quickly. And uh, Anybody else has any further questions as we look to wrap up with Dr. Moore? I would just like to make a comment and say thank you to Dr. Bob so much as her presentations are always enjoyable and interesting, informative. So thanks a lot, Dr. Bob. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Nicole. Okay, so again, a heartfelt thanks from the HR division to Dr. Bob Ward for joining us today. And of course, to all the participants um, for coming in. And I know that everyone, even though we may have changed circumstances, we do value what was shared. Um, I just want to remind you that uh, as children and as parents, as Dr. Bob said, we face challenges. So be mindful of them and work, work with your child as we maneuver this new change. Um, of course, you talked about tips for creating the atmosphere. So even if we go back into the physical space or we have a blend, you still, of course, can use those tips once the child is at home and learning. Um, Remember, of course, that we need help. We all need help as parents and as children. Give yourselves a break. And I particularly liked the sandwich method that she mentioned. And I think we can use it not just with schoolwork, but how we interact with our children. So that brings us to the end of the session for today. Of course, this session can be viewed later on Costa's YouTube channel. And uh, all participants who are here today, you'll receive your points for your workshop points for attending. And just a gentle reminder, of course, Dr. Matthew would send you a reminder that our next session is on Tuesday, the 27th, and we have Surviving the Pandemic, Nutrition and Healthy Eating. So that's going to be held at noon on Tuesday. So if you have any queries, you need any support, you need anything from us, HR is available at HR Services. Just drop us an email and we will be there. So again, thank you all for joining and uh, everyone subscribes and extending their thanks to Dr. Bob Ward for the information. So I urge you all to stay safe and uh, have a good rest of your afternoon. <laughs>